what I'll try and explain is some of the value that biodiversity and ecosystems bring to agriculture, especially if we work across these arenas. Um, Braulio, you mentioned uh, uh, pollinators, and I'll just, uh, sorry, uh, You mentioned uh, pollinators, and I think uh, um, befittingly I'll begin with that as an example because it's rarely recognized how much value pollination brings to agriculture. And it's possible to calculate it, as has been done over the past several years, by working out effectively the value of crops and plants and fruit and, and nuts during years in which there are poor bees and lack of bee populations and other years during which there are adequate bee populations. And you can also work it out based on how much it actually costs because countries like in the USA, you actually have to hire beehive uh, providers in order to pollinate uh, plants. And these are some of the calculations that are involved in estimating that the value of insect pollinators globally is of the order of $220 million or about 150 million euros. Now, the first interesting thing about that is, firstly, that all of this is invisible. When did a bee last send you an invoice? So these numbers don't get captured in any calculations that economists normally make. They don't get captured in global GDP. They are invisible. We don't measure them, and therefore we don't manage them. And that's the basic problem of the economic invisibility of nature and her so-called ecosystem services. The second important point here is that the value of pollinators is not consistent everywhere. I mean, there are crops which do not use insect pollination. There is also wind-based pollination. But there are certain sectors, particularly stimulants, co the coffee and cocoa plantations, nuts and fruit especially, where these values are extremely high. And remember, we are talking about a world in which, for right or wrong reasons, the total value of agricultural output is merely estimated at about $2.3 trillion, which is approximately 3% of global GDP. I always find it strange that something like water is a tiny fraction of a percent of GDP, food is 3% of GDP, and banking and advertising is several times that. What would you rather have, advertisers, bankers, or would you rather have food and water? But obviously our economics don't seem to reflect these realities. But anyway, here's an example. Now, the point I will make from beginning with the example of insect pollination as a value to agriculture is that, in fact, the whole ambit of biodiversity, biodiversity actually provides a huge amount to agriculture. Biodiversity is actually the living fabric of this planet. It is there, as the CBD defines it, at three layers, at ecosystems, at species layers, and at genetic layers. And you will find that it has quantity dimensions and quality dimensions. And quantities matter. Now, when we to look at fish in the oceans, it's the quantity of fish that provide animal proteins to the billion people in the developing world who use them. Of course, the species of fish also matter from the point of view of uh, tourism and, and coral reefs and so on. But at each of these layers, for instance, at ecosystems, the water regulation functions of forests and wetlands and the nutrient cycling functions of forests in terms of providing nutrients and feeding them down through aquifers into the fields of poor farmers, they are important contributors to agricultural output. Species, of course, food, fuel, and fiber comes from species, and pollinators are an example of what a species can provide to agriculture. And finally, genetic material and genetic diversity. Not only it's a question of finding uh, cures against diseases, but it's also about, through different strains of the same crops, actually providing resilience, providing the ability to survive if, for instance, one particular strain is wiped out. And I'm speaking about real experiences, as happened in the 70s in Asia, uh, the RIRI, RIRI, the International uh, Rice Research Institute, had discovered alternative strains for rice, which thankfully were put into, uh, into practice and enabled um, rice crops to be restored. So these are real values which we have experienced. But the key challenge is essentially the same challenge that biodiversity and ecosystems have anywhere, which is economic invisibility. We don't measure them, we don't value them. Because they are free is one of the reasons. Because value is what we receive, price is what we pay. These are not price services of nature, so therefore in our modern times we tend to confuse value with price and the net result is we don't value them. This is a challenge that both agriculturalists and uh, 
uh, ecologists and economists have to face together. And certainly my colleagues from the TEEB world, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, this project uh, which Braulio uh, uh, referred to, which I have, was privileged to lead, have focused their energies to make sure that these numbers are calculated, presented to policymakers, presented to business, and hopefully through that process they become economically visible. Now, news is not all good. I mean, I do remain an optimist. I'll try and finish in 20 minutes as well. But news is not all good. And I just want to show you a clip from the work that came from TEAB. And this is a projection of uh, biodiversity. One metric, one measure of biodiversity is called mean species abundance. Essentially, it means just the average amount of, let's say, tigers and toads and ticks, for the sake of argument, that are available now versus in their original state, which means the 17th century, before industrialization began. And the colors represent the percentage. So just because the tundra is green, that's not necessarily good news. It just means that it's close to what it was in 1700. And the red represents the lowest levels. In other words, 10% of the original stock, or 20%, and so on. Now look in this series of clips what is actually happening. And please focus on the two regions that I've pointed out, which is South Asia on the one hand, and Sub-Saharan Africa on the other. 1970, 2000, you can see the colors changing from green to orange to red, all the way to 2050. There are significant forecast losses. If we do business as usual, if we do not change policies, if we do not recognize the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, if we do exactly what we are doing now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is, going to, it is what is going to happen to biodiversity as measured by this mean species abundance. Let me run this cycle again. 1970, you can see how the colors are changing. This is scary, it's worrying, and this is actually the challenge that we have to try and address. Now, the, the sad thing is that the same regions, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, are also the regions, if you look at the work that's been done by CGIAR and others, these are the same regions where the highest projected food insecurity arises, and this is no coincidence. And indeed, if we look at planetary boundaries, some of you may not be familiar with this, but the concept of planetary boundaries uh, in this form was introduced by the Stockholm Resilience Center a few years ago. They talked about not just climate change being a boundary, but also ocean acidification, the loss of coral reefs, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, and of course biodiversity loss. And they pointed out that we were testing planetary boundaries, and in their opinion, we had actually exceeded them in the case of nitrogen and biodiversity and climate change. So three out of the nine boundaries, according to this group of scientists, had been exceeded. But my point is somewhat different. The point I'm making here is that six of these boundaries are actually connected and shared between agriculture and biodiversity. So when we talk about biodiversity loss, we lose resilience as a result of loss of genetics material, and we lose the ability of pollinators to provide crops. So one loss connects with the other. Nitrogen cycle and phosphorus cycle results in eutrophication, amongst other things, and impacts on ecosystems. They are connected. Fresh water is provided largely upstream and conserved and cycled and provided by forests and wetlands. If we lose those, then we lose fresh water, which affects, bi which affects agricultural yield and output. If we are not efficient in the use of land, in other words, land use change is excessive because of demand from agriculture, then the net result is loss of forests and wetlands. So one is connected there. And finally, climate change actually destroys crop yields at the same time as it destroys biodiversity. Crop yields are severely affected by climate change effects, and likewise is biodiversity. So these are shared boundaries, and this is the shared challenge between the world of biodiversity and the world of agriculture. How will we address these planetary boundaries which are approaching, and our current methods and our current lifestyle and our current models of economics are leading us in this direction of collision course against boundaries along different frontiers? This is a question not just of future generations, but of our own generation. In my own estimations, many of these boundaries are becoming critical within the next decade. So we are not talking about just future generations and 2050, but actually 2020. It becomes a matter of managing what is known as ecological footprint. And a footprint is a composite measure. It's basically the amount of land and near shore sea that one individual uses during her life. So the forest to absorb her carbon emissions, or the land to produce her meat and, and crops, or indeed the city area to provide living spaces, or the near shore uh, seas to provide fish, uh, fish for, for, uh, for the diet. Uh, 
these are all uh, combined into one measure called ecological footprint. The whole point here is that the total combined footprints of all people have to be within the capacity of planet Earth. So so-called Earth's biocapacity has been measured, and it's something like 1.8 global hectares per person. That is the dotted blue line, the horizontal line. Now, if you look at the countries that there are today, many of the developing world countries are at or below the level which is sustainable, which means they are at or below two global hectares. China is slightly above. India, Indonesia are, are somewhat below Nigeria, etc. The big, the big circles represent the populous countries. But most of the developed world, as you can see from the right-hand side, is well above the global average per capita footprint, and that is part of the challenge. In order for us to achieve the so-called sustainable development goals, in order for us to have a sustainable economy, every country, every country will have to be in that small blue box on the right-hand side. And the sad news is that at this stage, not a single country is in the small blue box on the right-hand side. But the strategies for getting there will be different. In the case of the developed world, it is about reducing footprint, getting energy efficient, resource efficient, changing consumption, changing production. In the case of the developing world, the countries along the, uh, close to the x-axis, if you can see that there, becoming sustainable and achieving human development above 0 0.8 on this scale of 0 0.3 to 1.0 is all about green development, basically developing in a way that does not increase your footprint substantially as you go along. Now, this concept has already been internalized in the world of the United Nations, so I'm very delighted that this next slide that I have from you is actually from the UNDP uh, development report. So they are using this concept as well, and I'm hopeful that in setting the so-called sustainable development goals and their measures, uh, the high-level panel who has met recently in Bali and also their advisors who are working on this will take cognizance of these acceptances and hopefully start using metrics of this kind. In order to achieve what we describe as green development, the most important aspect of of the economy and of sustainable development actually is agriculture. So what we call primary productivity, the productivity of land and near shore seas, that primary productivity is what needs to be increased. And when we are looking at primary productivity and looking at agriculture, nothing, ladies and gentlemen, is more important than the small farm. It's not widely understood that small farms today, 525 million of them, are actually where 60% of the land, arable land is. And half the world's food production is in small farms. But even more important than that, there are one billion livelihoods in small farms. And when I say small, most of these, that is 400 million of these farms, are just less than two hectares. That's tiny. That's, that's you know, like the backyard of the average home in the US. So the point is, this is where poverty resides. This is where the poor live and grow their food for their own consumption and for the local marketplace. And the yield on these small farms becomes critical for two reasons. One is that if we can increase the yield on what is basically half the arable land or 60% of the arable land, that means you can immediately address the problem of food production and food shortage. And secondly, higher yield on these small farms, which means more income in the hands of the poor. So if you can get yield up in these small farms, you are simultaneously addressing the problems of hunger and poverty. And these are the two most important problems I think most of you would agree. Why don't we do this? Because unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the entire discourse nowadays has been stolen by the, you know, the top four seed companies, the top ten fertilizer companies. The advocates of, of intensive agriculture have just completely stolen the march. And people don't talk about small farms. Of course, I never tire of doing so, but then, you know, I'm an optimist, as they say. Um, the reason why I'm an optimist is because of the facts. The facts is there were two very important studies, one of which was done by the FAO, in fact, and the other one done by Jules Priti and other scientists, which demonstrate that if you apply ecologically friendly farming methods, for example, that Braulio had given in his presentation, if you apply ecologically friendly farming methods, and these can be different forms, you know, for instance, they could be uh, the, the no tillage example that you gave, Braulio, or it could be uh, recycling farm water or, reusing, or using farm manure or even rotating crop species, or using different strains of the same crop to prevent losses against pests, and so on and so forth. It, different examples. I will come to one from my own country, which has been, just been proved there, which is a system of rice intensification. But all these methods collectively can result in a substantial increase in yield. 
in the example that Julius Priti and, and his team worked on, they had 57, they had 285 different uh, schemes, sustainable farming schemes, across 57 developing countries in several million farms. And the answer was that the average yield went up about 79%. So can you just imagine, just think of the simple arithmetic here, 60% of land, 80% increase in yield, 8, 6 is up 48. That means you can grow 50%, 48% more food as a result of that. That is how big the solution is that is staring us in the face. Hunger and poverty focus the small farm. Ecologically friendly farming, which will result not just in a solution to the agricultural issues that face us, the food production issues, but also, as Braulio and hopefully others will point out, to the problem of ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss. Because these small farming techniques are a lot less costly on the local environment, on the local ecology, than the intensive farming use of pesticides and fertilizers. One small example I close with from my own country, India, is the system of rice intensification. Now, India has not traditionally been known for high yields in rice. In fact, there's a constant comparison between China and India. But the good news here is that using this system, which is basically putting the rice, the paddy, uh, uh, plants further apart, not using three stages where you have the initial seedlings and then another cr other area and a third area, and not using flooding techniques, but actually drip irrigation techniques, sprinkler irrigation and drip irrigation techniques. So using minimal water, not too much water, and spacing them out further, they have been able to increase yields substantially. And the example that I have is from the state of Bihar uh, and in the Nalanda district. And there the increase was such that they got 22.4 tons per hectare as against the last record, which was in China, of 19 tons per hectare. Not just one farmer, there were actually four farmers who achieved such yields. Now, this is just one example, and that, again, different variants in different locations. Broadly, the system is already used in about 50 countries. And wherever it is used, there are substantial increases in yield, doubling of yield taking place. These are the actual statistics for the example I mentioned in India, which was used in Nalanda district in Bihar, increasing the yield in those small farms to an extent where they became world records, world records held by these small farmers in the Kharif, the winter crop which took place in 2011. That's just about a year ago. So there is hope. That's the reason why I'm optimistic. But it needs these techniques, these methods, these solutions to come to the front. It needs the communities of both the world of biodiversity and ecosystems, as well as the world of agriculture, to step forward and say, yes, we see the way forward. Yes, we see examples. We wish to invest in the knowledge that is needed, and we wish to invest in the investment on the ground that is needed to be able to replicate these examples and to scale them so that they become global solutions and not just success stories. That's what I would hope will happen. Thank you.